Welcome everyone. My name is Sharon Mitten uh, and I'm Head of Fundraising and Philanthropy here at the Flory. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time to connect with us today. I know the format is a little different, but regardless, it's fantastic to be with you all today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on where we are today. The Flory Institute is on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd all also like to extend these respects to all elders past, present and emerging from all the lands from where you are joining us today. We celebrate the traditional owners as the first scientists deeply respect their sophisticated knowledge systems. For all those attending who are not familiar with our work, the Flory is the largest brain research group in the Southern Hemisphere. Our work is critical as diseases of the brain and mind affect us all in some way. In fact, every year, 4.7 million Australians are diagnosed with one of the conditions we study. This year and last year have highlighted the importance and need of our work more than ever since our beginnings. Topics which we live and breathe daily as, medical, as a medical research institute have been under the spotlight and in the public sphere. From much needed mental health research funding to the complexities of clinical trials and the long-term impacts of COVID-19, we are grateful to see healthy public debate and discussion around the all-important role that medical research plays in our country. As a great Australian innovator, the Flory has adapted to the new landscape and sees opportunity in this crisis, despite the damage it has caused. Thank you to all our donors who've joined us this morning. As a medical research institute, our work relies heavily on your support. Ways you can support our research is by spreading the word about the Flory and the learnings you take away from the lecture today. If you're not already a Flory donor, we invite you to consider becoming one. All contributions, big and small, are tax deductible and take us one step closer in our quest to find the cures for diseases that affect the brain and mind. You can also support our work by leaving a gift in your will. If this is something you would like to consider, please email the fundraising team after the lecture. We'd also like to keep you up to date with the latest research at the Flory and invite you to join our ma mailing list if you're not already a su subscriber. Please head to the Flory website to sign up. I'd now like to introduce to you our very special presenter today. Professor Anthony Hannon is an NHMRC Principal Research Fellow and Head of the Epigenics and Neuroplasticity Laboratory at the Flory. Professor Hannon received his undergraduate training and PhD from the University of Sydney. He was then awarded a non-full medical fellowship at the University of Oxford, where he subsequently held other research positions before returning to Australia on an NHMRC career development fellowship to establish a laboratory the Flory Institute. He has since held other fellowships, including an ARC FT3 Future Fellowship and an NHMRC Senior Research Fellowship. Professor Hannon and colleagues provided the first, and his colleagues provided the first demonstration in any genetic preclinical model that environmental stimulation can be therapeutic. This has led to new insights into gene-environment interactions in various brain disorders, including Huntington's disease, dementia, depression, schizophrenia, autism, and anxiety disorders. His laboratory at the Flory explores how genes and the environment combine via experience-dependent plasticity in health and disease brain, and the disease brain. On that note, I would like to stop and hand over to Professor Tony Hannum. Welcome, Professor. Great. Thank you, Sharon, and the other organisers from the Flory. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all virtually here today. Okay, today I'm going to tell you about three really exciting revolutions that are occurring within neuroscience. And uh, the three revolutions will be around neuroplasticity, genomics, and epigenetics. 
Okay. Just to introduce the Flory to those who aren't aware, it's Australia's largest neuroscience institute, and we really work on a range of neurological and psychiatric disorders that covers every aspect of brain and mind dysfunction. So you can see all these major disorders on this list. And I imagine that you or a family member or close friend has been affected by one or more of these disorders. Because when you add them up, this burden of disease of these combined neurological and psychiatric disorders outstrips every other health condition. We can see them also on a timeline here so that brain and mind disorders affect us at every stage of life from disorders of brain development that the Flory works on, but also disorders of late life that I'll speak of as well. And so in order to be able to prevent, treat and eventually cure these disorders, we need to understand what causes each disorder and how we can use that information to develop new therapies, new approaches for prevention and for cure. Just speaking again of the burden of disease, it's enormous. So this affects, including all brain and mind disorders, affects around 1.5 billion people, and that's growing worldwide. It's 25% of the total burden of disease and 75% of the population will suffer from a brain or mind condition in their lifetime. So brain and mind disorders place the greatest burden on health. And as we go forward out of this pandemic and the majority of people get vaccinated and we have other treatments, uh, antiviral treatments and so on, we'll be left with the disorders we had before this pandemic. And neurological and psychiatric disorders are the greatest burden and in fact, there's growing evidence that the stress of the pandemic is leading perhaps to a, an ongoing mental health pandemic that will follow, but also other aspects of COVID-19 might increase predisposition to disorders of brain and mind. And we know that the virus can affect the brain and may actually trigger uh, brain disorders in, in some vulnerable individuals. Getting back to our focus here, in my group at the Flory, we're particularly interested in understanding how nature and nurture combines. That is how genetics and environment combine to either make you predisposed or resilient to a range of different brain disorders. And I list some of them here. I'll, I'll speak briefly about some of these uh, disorders of brain and mind in this talk, but much of what I talk about will have broader relevance to a whole variety of neurological and psychiatric disorders. So at conception, we all receive a genome that's provided half by our father, half by our mother. And that is something that sculpts our development, including brain development. And as we go on, the environment and what I call environment, your total environmental experience from conception through to old age comes into play. However, some of our more recent research at the Flory suggests that your environment doesn't just start at conception, it starts prior to conception because this epigenetic information can be carried from your parents and even from your grandparents to influence your biology, including your predisposition or resilience to a whole range of different disorders. So this is a focus here, showing the human brain using a technique called magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. And this is one area where Flory really is one of the world leaders. And what we have here is the 1.5 kilograms or so of soft gray and white matter lying within your skull. And from that 1.5 kilograms comes all of your thoughts, your emotions, your ability to move, and so on. Here's another way we can render this information from this MRI brain imaging to understand how the human brain might change over time. So you can see here on the left, over time, 
this human brain changing from five to 20 years of age. And down the bottom, you'll see these colours changing. And that, that's the change that's occurring over time between five and 20 years of age. And what that really means is change of colours is that over time, this surface of the brain, the cerebral cortex, which is so important for thought, motion, movement, and so on, is sculpted by experience, by your environment, and by your lifestyle. And this MRI approach clearly shows this experience-dependent sculpting of brain structure and function over time. The other key understanding here is that the brain is not just a supercomputer. It's very dynamic and it's not hardwired. And that's where we need to understand neuroplasticity, the way in which the brain, more than any other organ in the body, responds to the environment, responds to experience, and responds to lifestyle over time. It's extraordinarily complex. So our brains have approximately 100 billion neurons, and they have an even greater number of what we call glia, another key cell type in the brain. And these 100 billion neurons are interconnected by approximately 1,000 trillion synapses. So that's a level of complexity we're trying to grapple with in understanding the human brain and also trying to understand what goes wrong in a whole range of different brain disorders. So in science, we stand on the shoulders of giants and we always build on what came before. And there's been, for centuries and uh, millennia, humans have tried to understand the human brain and cognition and, and behaviour. And one early set of studies were done by Franz Joseph Gore. And so these are largely now discredited uh, because what he did at the time in the absence of brain imaging or any other technique was that he felt the bumps on the outside of the skull and... Uh, we tried to use that information to understand how people's personalities and abilities uh, were derived from the brains within that skull. And so this was termed phrenology. And, uh, you know, I've heard people joke about um, the idea of brain imaging might be a, a modern phrenology with coloured lights, but the key difference is that brain imaging in neuroscience is based on hard science and evidence whereas uh, phrenology was more or less a hypothesis which was disproven. Now, this slide was generated by my colleague Emma Burrows about five years ago uh, before this first election of Trump. And so while it's somewhat dated now, uh, the slide itself, I think we have uh, a definitive answer to this experiment. Uh, and indeed, he did lose it. So this first revolution... I'm talking about here is a revolution of neural plasticity. And as I mentioned before, until recently, it was thought that the brain was like a supercomputer and essentially fixed throughout adulthood. But we now know that the brain changes not just during development, but changes throughout adult life. And it's really the only organ in the body that does so, so in such a complex in a dynamic way. Plasticity can occur daily and learning and memory, which is so intrinsic to all aspects of human life, involves a form of plasticity. And so in order to lay down new memories, we have to change the strength and the number of connections between these brain cells so that neurons that fire together, wire together. And that's one way in which we lay down new memories. And therefore, disorders of memory, such as Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, may be uh, disorders of brain plasticity and disorders of, uh, of the connections between neurons and their ability to lay down new memories, but also retrieve old memories. We know that there's a whole range of things that change uh, the brain, and this can be demonstrated in a range of different ways. For example, studying musicians and 
taxi drivers learning new street maps and uh, students studying, learning a language. And a classic study, which I'll mention here, involved an experiment uh, of juggling. To introduce this goes back to this technique of magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. As I said, the floor is, is one of the world leaders in this area. And you see here uh, this brain imaging machine where the subject lies horizontal and um, the head is entered in this machine and essentially it allows you to form the structure, but also to make Im inferences about the, the function of the brain. So people can do cognitive and other tasks while their head is being imaged, their brain in fact. So this is getting back to this technique, MRI. And here's one experiment in which these group of young healthy volunteers who'd never juggled before were divided into groups and the controls didn't learn to juggle whereas the jugglers obviously learned to juggle over a period of time for the first time. And what they found in this experiment, and you can see here the parts of the brain, and we're really looking down at the top, on the top of the brain, were parts of the brain and the wiring in the brain where changes occur due to juggling. And so this was a dramatic demonstration that learning a new skill like juggling could lead to structural changes in the brain that were long-term and persisted even later on um, after these individuals uh, had stopped juggling. So it suggested that lifelong learning causes structural as well as functional changes in the human brain. I'm now going to move on to this second exciting revolution, and it's a revolution of genomics. So we're really just two decades on from the first sequence of the human genome, which was approximately 3 billion letters of DNA. And as I said, your genome is formed at conception, half from your father and half from your mother. And it dictates how your body and brain develops in utero, but also how it continues to develop after birth through a combination of genetics, as well as environmental factors and epigenetics that I'll talk about later on. So now with the, the wonders of this new technology, each genome, including potentially yours, could be sequenced for um, even less than $1,000 potentially. That's how far this technology moved. However, we have an enormous way to go to make sense of this complexity of how each genome makes us unique, but how a given genome makes you either predisposed or resilient to a given disorder, and we're particularly focused on brain and mind disorders. One area I've been particularly interested in are these sequences of repetitive DNA in the human genome. And the, the term here is repetome, all of those repetitive sequences of DNA in the human genome. And some of these are what we call tandem repeats, where it's like a genetic stutter, where these sequences of DNA are repeated one after the other. There's over 1.5 million discrete tandem repeats interspersed across the whole human genome. And one of these, we know when it expands and mutates, can cause Huntington's disease. And there's over 50 others that could cause a whole range of other different disorders via a mutation in a single gene. One very exciting set of discoveries that have occurred in the last year is that some of these genetic stutters or mutations in repetitive DNA can cause autism. And so this is a major breakthrough that will help us understand autism and be able to move forward and uh, improve the lives of those with autism and their families. And that's one area of research that's ongoing at the Flory Institute. So showing here the idea that that DNA, the repeat, in this case, you can see a repeat of these DNA bases, CCG, CCG, CCG. And when this repeating sequence um, expands as a mutation, that can contribute to uh, 
these changes in brain development that can predispose an individual to autism. And this may be in combination with environmental factors and what we call epigenetics that I'll talk about later. All right, moving along to another disorder caused by this repetitive DNA or these Tanner repeat mutations is Huntington's disease. And this is one of the most devastating of all diseases because it's inherited from either parent and an individual that has this gene mutation is destined to die after suffering progressive symptoms for approximately 10 to 20 years, although 5% of cases have childhood onset and it kills these children much, much more quickly. Huntington's disease uh, has affected a whole variety of people, uh, including Woody Guthrie. And so Bob Dylan is my favourite singer, songwriter, and one of my favourite Nobel laureates. He won the Nobel Prize in 2016 for literature. And <clears throat> Bob Dylan, as a songwriter and musician, also stood on the shoulders of giants. And, and one of his uh, inspirations was the American folk singer, Woody Guthrie. And you can see here at the top this quote from Woody where he started to develop Huntington's disease, including this career, these writhing dance-like movements. And people said, Woody's, Woody's drunk. And he describes how, how he lost control of his body. And he, he prefers a disease that you can sober up from. It's a compelling description. And so as eventually Woody lay dying and uh, it, in, from Huntington's disease, Bob Dylan visited on his deathbed. And uh, this inspired Bob Dylan to write these lyrics. And you can see here, these lyrics are, are, are timeless and they could be written uh, now when, when he's saying, hey, hey, Woody Guthrie, I wrote you a song about a funny old world that's coming along. It's sick and it's hungry, it's tired and it's torn. It looks like it's dying and it's hardly been born. So moving on now to trying to understand Huntington's disease so that we can develop new ways to prevent and treat it and eventually cure it. Uh, we start with this gene mutation, if you like, this genetic stutter passed on by one of the parents. And the symptoms, I mentioned the chorea or the movement disorder, but it also results in cognitive deficits culminating in dementia. It's a different dementia to Alzheimer's, but it is a form of dementia. And it also results in psychiatric symptoms, the most common of which is depression. And my group at the Flory has been instrumental in understanding both depression and dementia as it occurs in Huntington's disease. And in fact, the role for environmental factors in modifying Huntington's disease. As I mentioned, it uh, usually strikes in the fourth or fifth decade of life, the prime of life, but can uh, affect children as young as two years of age and, and will kill them very quickly when it affects children. Huntington's as a disorder caused by this genetic stutter or repetitive DNA sits in a family that includes fragile X syndrome, Friedrich ataxia, but now we know that ALS or motor neuron disease as well as frontotemporal dementia can be caused by these repetitive DNA gene mutations. So it's a very important and a very large group of human disorders. Looking now at the, the brain here uh, and looking side on, you can see down the bottom in blue, uh, major brain areas affected by Huntington's, including the cerebral cortex around the outside and parts of what we call the basal ganglia, the striatum, and uh, that, that uh, is affected particularly by Huntington's, but we increasingly feel that it affects other parts of the brain as well. And as I'll mention later, um, it can affect the body, not just the brain. All right, so in order to understand and develop new ways to prevent and treat these disorders, we need to be able to model the disorder. And 
the nature of this disorder where there's a single gene means there's a whole range of animal models that can be generated to understand and develop new treatments. However, uh, we haven't used goats. We've, we've used mice as the majority of people in biomedical research use them because they have genomes that are remarkably similar to humans and they have brains that model all the important structures in the human brain. But um, they're able to be studied under laboratory conditions in order to run what we call preclinical trials that are absolutely essential in order to develop new clinical trials uh, in order to treat disorders. And in our focus, of course, is brain disorder. What I'm showing here is uh, one of the first key experiments we did in this area where we took the mice that had the Huntington's mutation and we and others have been able to show that these mice develop uh, cognitive changes modeling dementia. We showed for the first time that they develop changes relevant to depression, the most common psychiatric symptom in Huntington, but they also develop the movement disorder or chorea. And that's under standard conditions, but when we add novelty and complexity and toys and we increase sensory stimulation, cognitive stimulation and opportunities for voluntary physical activity, what we found in this first experiment was that compared to standard mice that didn't get the same cognitive stimulation for physical activity, they developed, 100% of them developed Huntington symptoms uh, by this adult stage here around five months of age. Whereas those that received the environmental enrichment, increased cognitive stimulation, increased physical activity, had a dramatic delay in Huntington's disease. All right, so we wanted to understand, as I said, the cognitive changes and the dementia in Huntington's disease. And yes, we can't get these mice to solve crosswords, but you'd be surprised uh, at the complexity of the tasks that we can get these mice to do. And we have a range of uh, cognitive tasks, including having the mice use devices that look somewhat like an iPad or a touch, touch screen that very closely model what psychology tests someone would undergo, for example, in a clinical trial for Alzheimer's, other dementia or schizophrenia. And we can relate our work very closely to the human situation. And therefore, it's more likely we can translate our work into new treatments. All right, so a challenge here when trying to understand complex psychiatric disorders like depression is how you might actually model this in any animal. And uh, it's not easy, but uh, the reality is that we have some advantages with a disorder like depression because there are some treatments like antidepressant drugs, or in fact, um, exercise shows some benefits uh, for some people that we can test in uh, a mouse model relevant to depression. And indeed, uh, that is something that we've been able to do. We found the first evidence that uh, we could model depression-like behavioral changes in Huntington's that closely map to de the depression that's extremely common in clinical Huntington's disease. But also following up this environmental enrichment, we're able to show that mice that just had running wheels increased physical exercise also showed delay and onset of the dementia, the depression-like behaviours and the movement disorder modelling career. And so out of this work, uh, we're following this up with clinical colleagues to see whether these approaches such as physical activity can help delay onset of clinical Huntington's but also using our work at the level of molecules and cells to try and develop new drugs that can be taken into clinical trials for Huntington's disease. Now, part of the wonders of neuroscience is not just that these 100 billion or so neurons in the brain are extraordinarily complex and important, but they're also quite beautiful. So you can see within the cerebral cortex is key, what we call a pyramidal neuron, can receive over 10,000 connections from other neurons in the brain. And so this is part of the complexity and the beauty that we deal with every day as neuroscientists. You see, when we zoom in on this particular neuron, uh, 
here's its connections with other neurons. These synapses are really important, we think, uh, for cognition and motion and movement, but also that's partly what goes wrong in many different brain disorders. So you can see here, going back to the brilliant work of uh, the Nobel laureate, Ramon Ikahal, uh, who first over a hundred years ago drew these neurons, but also really came up with this idea that neurons were intrinsic to brain function and things like cognition. And now we have fancier techniques where we can study them and um, with, with different colors and so on under quite fancy microscopes, but it all builds on this understanding of how neurons develop and function and how they connect via these synapses. And you can see an example here where this environmental enrichment, this increased cognitive stimulation, physical activity can lead to structural changes in the brain. So on the right here, you can see a, a part of a neuron, it's what we call a dendrite, that is forming extra um, synapses on it in response to this increased cognitive stimulation and physical activity. So we think exercise is really important, not just for the body, but it's important for the brain and it can lead to the release of key molecules such as brain growth factors that are involved in things like learning and memory and other aspects of brain plasticity. And we think that physical activity can uh, help delay onset of a whole range of disorders, including Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So the final part I want to mention is this third revolution of epigenetics. So epigenetics is really above the genome. And so there are two ways you can think about epigenetics. If you think about the 20,000 or so genes in the human genome, if you think about them as instruments in this enormous orchestra, then think about epigenetics as the musicians. When you bring together the instruments and the musicians, what you have is the symphony of life. If you prefer a bookish analogy, then think about the 20,000 genes as words in a book and think about, or an instruction manual really, it's an instruction ma manual for your, your body and your brain. And think about epigenetics as ways in which you can bold or underline or make italics or even fluorescent highlighters that change the way in which each gene is expressed over time in every cell in your body. And they're the two analogies really of epigenetics. So you can see here a strand of DNA and epigenetics is not changing the sequence of DNA, it's changing the modifications, chemical modifications of the DNA to make individual genes more active or inactive in particular cells in your body at particular times in your life. And we know that important lifestyle factors like stress, diet, exercise, behavior, and even toxins can change epigenetics. And that's the way that genes and environment interact or nature and nurture interacts over time in your body and your brain to make you either more vulnerable or more resilient to any given disorder. And so we can think of epigenetics as switches on these genes that uh, can be switched more, more like a dimmer switch actually rather than off and on. Uh, and so it can be, the gene can be tuned up or tuned down by epigenetics through space across your body as well as through time. I'm just showing here a slide from my colleague, Anne-Louise Ponsonbury. And the beauty of the Flory is that we have this very dynamic and productive interaction between neuroscientists trying to understand mechanisms and develop new treatments and other scientists and clinicians like Anne Louise, who are taking data from humans and clinical studies and feeding them back into our mouse models. And then we feed our discoveries back into the clinic, including into clinical trials. And this dynamic 
interplay between the preclinical and clinical is what makes the Flores research so powerful and what will allow us eventually to provide new ways to prevent, to treat and cure a whole range of these different brain disorders. This is just showing another example of a clinical study uh, driven by Anne-Louise Ponsonbury and colleagues. Uh, and this work is really showing that by studying samples, for example, uh, samples from pregnant women, cord blood at birth and um, blood samples uh, during development, we can start to understand not just how genetics is contributing to particular brain disorders, but how environment and lifestyle can modify predisposition or resilience based on epigenetics. So getting back to this understanding the basics, what you're looking at here is essentially a pile of brains. And think about each of these brains having been generated via a different genome. But part of this understanding is that the red and the blue brains at the outside are brains at the outside of a bell curve of normal brain development. And those red and blue brains, because they're outside of the bell curve, are more at risk of particular disorders like autism and schizophrenia. And we know that genomes evolve very slowly. So our genomes are more or less the same as the genomes were in our caveman hunter-gatherer ancestors. So if any disorder, for example, autism, is increasing within a generation or two, as some researchers suggest, then it's not the genome changing. It must be changes in environmental exposures. And what we're thinking about here is environmental exposures that affect whole populations. And so thinking about the way in which that may change the shape of the bell curve, lead to more of these red and blue brains at the outside of the bell curve that may ultimately be at greater risk of a disorder such as autism and schizophrenia. And this is one hypothesis we're pursuing to try and understand these major brain disorders and be able to um, help improve and, and develop ways towards uh, prevention and help families affected by these disorders. Moving on now is the idea of epigenetics running across generations. So epigenetics can be passed on from one generation to the next at conception. So you can get epigenetic factors that are influenced not just by your mother and the factors in utero when you develop, but also by your father. And this is um, some work that we've pioneered here at the Flora Institute, evidence that environmental exposures and lifestyles of a father before conception can change the epigenetics of his sperm and therefore after conception can change the developing embryo and perhaps change predisposition to brain disorders. And this is something we're actively pursuing and uh, with collaborators in Parkville, we've uh, been able to show that just last year that this was work driven by our collaborator, Chris Tonkin and Shiraz Taibji, and able to show that even infection with a parasite before conception in these male mice could change their sperm epigenetics and could change the brain and behavior of the offspring. So this is something that we're following up now and we've taken this discovery and what we're trying to understand is whether other forms of infection such as viruses, and in particular, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, could affect the next generation, not just through mothers, but potentially through infected fathers. And this obviously has enormous public health implications and is one of the many ways we're pursuing these recent discoveries. Putting this together, you can see a range of different environmental factors, such as Stress, which I haven't mentioned as much, but stress is an extremely important environmental factor and lifestyle factor that has relevance to brain disorders. But also these factors like environmental enrichment and physical activity. And we've been able to show that these environmental factors 
and lifestyle factors can change sperm epigenetics and via conception, they can impact on brain development and function and therefore lead to changes in cognition and behaviour, which we think may actually make someone more or less predisposed to disorders of the brain, such as psychiatric disorder, including depression and anxiety disorder. We've extended this work more recently to understand other environmental factors, such as the effect of diet. And we have recent evidence, uh, as do colleagues, that diet of individuals before conception, including fathers before conception, can change the epigenetics of the sperm and can change brain development and function of the offspring, which obviously has major public health implications. Think about the lifestyle factors that have changed in recent generations, the pervasion of junk food and poor diet, the pervasion of sedentary behaviour, that is less physical activity. And uh, for some individuals, including during the pandemic, increased high levels of chronic stress. And we have been able to show at the floor in recent years that uh, high levels of stress hormone in males before conception changes their sperm epigenetics and therefore changes brain development and function of their offspring. Bringing this together, we think these important factors like stress and physical activity and cognitive stimulation can impact the brain, but also in positive ways. So positive lifestyle factors may help build up brain reserve and individuals with more brain reserve may be able to slow down brain aging and delay onset of disorders of brain aging, such as Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, also potentially Parkinson's disease, which along with Alzheimer's is a major brain disorder being studied at the Florey Institute. So bringing this together, uh, we've put forward this schema and published it recently, the idea that physical exercise may be one component to help us understand what I call environmentics. They would be novel therapies which mimic or enhance the beneficial effects of cognitive stimulation and physical activity. A subset of these environmentics would be uh, exercise memetics, which mimic or enhance the beneficial effects of physical activity. And the idea here is if we can understand how physical activity benefits the brain and body right down to the level of molecules, some of these molecules may be targets for new therapeutics, including drugs, that we could develop to prevent and treat a whole range of disorders, including the brain disorders I've been telling you about today. So bringing this all together, I used to say we're all dealt a genetic deck of cards at conception that we can do nothing about. That's still the case. But this new work uh, at the Florian and elsewhere has been able to show that we also dealt an epigenetic deck of cards at conception. One important factor here is that unlike genetics, short of gene editing approaches such as CRISPR gene editing, epigenetics may be reversible because these epigenetic modifications uh, we think can be modified over time. And therefore, if you look at the blue arrows here, going down shows that someone who, because of their genetics and epigenetics and environmental factors, may be predisposed to a particular brain disorder but increased cognitive and physical activity may help build protective brain reserve. And someone who develops a dysfunctional brain may be able to undergo functional compensation associated with this brain reserve. And someone who eventually develops a particular brain disorder, we think we can develop new treatments, including environmentics and a subclass called exercise memetics to push them over this side where we all want to be which is healthy brain function and aging. So it's an extraordinarily complex puzzle that we're trying to solve at the Flory, both to understand brain development and function, but in doing so, to develop new ways to prevent, to treat, and eventually cure this range of devastating brain disorders. As general tips for the public, there are five key factors that uh, you can implement to try and slow down the aging of your body, but also the aging of your brain to help protect you from a range of different brain disorders. 
So staying physically active we know is important, not just for the body, but also for the brain. Staying mentally active or cognitively stimulating, including via approaches such as lifelong learning and brain training, uh, if they're long-term uh, activities that you enjoy and persist with, uh, can be particularly beneficial for the brain and we think could slow down brain aging. A healthy diet is good, not just uh, for your body, but also for your brain. And managing stress levels is also good for the body and the brain, as is maintaining healthy sleep patterns. And part of this is that we have made breakthroughs also at the Flory and my group in recent times, where we're the first to discover that this microbiota, these trillions of bacteria in your gut, are actually affected by Huntington's disease. And we know that various other brain disorders, these gut bacteria are affected by these different brain disorders. And they're talking to your brain. There's a crosstalk between the, uh, the gut and the brain. And that's one area we think that these environmental factors that initially act on the body might act on the brain, for example, by the gut. And that's a very active area that we're pursuing. So finally, uh, we're trying to piece together the brain, brain development and brain function and brain dysfunction, and how the genome, the environment, and these environmental factors might work together so that we can ultimately push towards prevention, treatment, and eventual cure of a whole range of brain disorders. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge and thank these wonderful people in my group, past and present. I've just been absolutely inspired by their dedication, particularly in the last almost 18 months under COVID. You wouldn't believe how hard these people work, how dedicated they are, um, and how they push through this pandemic to keep their absolutely crucial medical research going. Um, I pay tribute to them, and uh, I continue to be inspired by the talent and their extraordinary dedication. I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any and all questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tony. Uh, I love the way that you use analogies to help us all understand the complexities of your research. Um, yeah, it, it, it is very, very useful. I also love that your research cuts across so many diseases of the brain and, and the mind. And, and I know that your research hasn't happened overnight, although you've had some massive breakthroughs in recent times. I know how much hard work um, that you've put in and, and how passionate you are about it. Um, my, my big takeaway from today is the overwhelming evidence to support the positive outcomes of enriched physical activity um, and, and I guess importantly, overall environmental enrichment for us all and the important part that it plays in the generation of neurons. I also really, really like the idea of, of functional the functional disorders and the opportunity to repair, and I hope we've got some questions around that today. I'm sure everyone agrees that your work is hugely important. Um, we've received many, many questions today, so <laughs> Tony, all the very best for that. I'll now hand over to Mark uh, in the Simonson from our fundraising and philanthropy team to facilitate Q&A. Uh, one from Karen is, are you concerned about the early indications that COVID-19 is impacting on memory and IQ? Look, that's a great question, Karen, and we certainly are. This is a focus of the Flory. Obviously, the beauty of establishing a world-class institute like the Flory is that when a population and a country uh, gets confronted by a new disorder like the virus SARS-CoV-2 that caused COVID-19, we're geared up to pivot and take on these important questions. And my group, as I mentioned, is working on a COVID-19 project at the Flory and other colleagues at the Flory are also working on COVID-19. So the evidence is emerging that people who are infected and not just people who end up in ICU and really sick, um, but others who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and develop COVID-19, uh, a proportion develop what's called long COVID. And even more acutely, some individuals uh, develop neurological symptoms, for example, problems with taste and smell, 
and some problems with cognition, we think, that uh, we don't understand at all, but we know that the virus can affect the brain and other parts of the nervous system. That's one component acutely. But then chronically, there's people who develop long COVID. Some aspects of long COVID involve neurological and psychiatric symptoms, which we don't understand. We need to understand because we're now approaching um, 5 million people who have died internationally of um, COVID-19 and um, a couple of hundred million people globally have been infected by SARS-CoV-2. So what we're in now is an extraordinarily um, complex experiment in progress with this new pandemic. And we need to make sure we don't just um, get everyone vaccinated, and that's step one, and, and use public health and science to get out of this acute pandemic. But we need to find out um, for those who have been infected uh, what it's done to their bodies and brains and how we actually um, deal with this in the long term. Next question is, how fundamentally different is the structure of the autistic brain? Look, that, that's a great question and complex question. And uh, the phrase used is autism spectrum disorder, and that recognises that it's not just one simple disorder, it's a spectrum. And the changes are very complex, they're not simple at all. So you can do brain imaging, but if someone looks at a brain image, say that's blinded and you don't know whether it's come from someone with autism or, or a match control, just, just looking at the brain is um, not going to allow you to even determine whether that person has autism or not. However, using this genetics I talked about, but also trying to understand the role of environment, we can start to understand not just how um, the, the brains of someone with autism differs at that level of whole brain imaging, but how they differ at the level of molecules and cells. And so this may be a way that we can help um, individuals and their families deal with this because it's not just the core symptoms of autism, such as social interaction and, um, and speech and um, repetitive and restricted movements, because we know autism can be comorbid with epilepsy, with attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder or ADHD with gut problems, with sleep problems. And so we need to understand that complexity, what we call comorbidities that, that mean that someone with autism spectrum disorder may effectively have more than one disorder. And, um, and we need to ultimately um, be able to help the whole person um, and, and confront that complexity really. Yeah, another question on autism here. Can you elaborate on the research indicating that older men are more likely to have children with autism? Yeah, that's a great and, and highly informed question. And th there is some data out there, but it's very complex. And, uh, and some of the, the data we're talking about are uh, men who are outside the normal uh, range of fatherhood, say in their 60s and 70s and so on, quite elderly fathers. And obviously some, some men do become fathers at that age. And uh, there's a bit of data out there. If we say that autism in the general population might be about 1%, um, you know, say about 1% of the normal population, there's some suggestions that uh, if the father is much older, um, then it's possible that the chance of that child having autism may go up twofold, for example. Um, so, but then they're 2% at risk. That doesn't mean they'll, they'll get autism. It just means they're 2% at risk rather than 1% at risk. We, we don't know whether it's um, the, the, the sperm, whether it's DNA mutations or epigenetics or both. And that's something where um, potentially could follow up as well, that there might be both in you know, older men, um, there might be both genetic and epigenetic changes that um, contribute to this. Um, I think a question you've partly answered is about whether cognitive abilities uh, and um, things can be measured by, measured by brain imaging, but also a suggestion here, why don't we measure the cerebral cortex growth to age 25? Well, that's a, a very good and informed question again. And uh, indeed, um, that was just one study I was showing there people measured to 25, including the Florian throughout life. Obviously, Flory with its um, brain imaging is working on Alzheimer's, on Parkinson's disease, on stroke, on epilepsy, um, and so on, world leaders in all these areas, as well as um, you know, schizophrenia and, and depression and so on. And so, yes, 
these measurements do go on to 25. And there are particular parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, which is really important for cognition and emotion and so on, where even these structural changes don't end at 20, they go on as far as we think maybe 25. So very interesting, the idea that someone, not just late teens, but maybe at early 20s, um, their brain's still actively developing, even at that kind of gross structural level. So that's a, a very insightful question. Um, a question here about uh, exercise, the benefit of exercise. Is the exercise, if exercise, for example, induces synaptic strengthening, is the modification permanent or is it mm. dependent on continued exercise? Oh, wow, these are great, great questions. Got a great audience here. Um, so, yes, we're very interested in all of these environmental factors. Uh, we talk of the concept of critical periods. So we're studying when you do the environmental intervention for a period of time and different periods of time, you know, if you do it early, can you prevent onset of a brain disorder? If you do it when someone has early symptoms, can you slow progression? And when, if you do it early and then stop, do you get long-term benefit? And the evidence is, say, if you're very physically active, um, you may build up what I was talking about, brain reserve, which will help you. But if you then completely stop physical activity, um, you know, you'll lose some of that benefit. Maybe not all of that benefit, but you may lose some of the benefit. So uh, the idea is with these positive lifestyle factors like um, physical activity, diet, cognitive stimulation, uh, is that they need to be maintained. Um, yes, they may have some long-term impacts, but in order to have the, the biggest impacts, they need to be maintained in the long term as well. Um, another good question. Is it just the environment or rather our perception of the environment that regulate gene expression? Oh, that's a, that's a somewhat philosophical uh, question, which I always like. And so essentially perception in itself uh, is uh, a bunch of neurons sending messages to each other. And it's a very interesting area, which we partly work on sensory perception. Some of our um, tests involve understanding vision, understanding smell, understanding hearing, um, these forms of perception. And so when you talk about perception, uh, perception is really the endpoint of sensory processing, which is a, a change in the firing of a subset of neurons within your brain. So indeed, when we provide environmental enrichment, we give more sensory stimulation, which changes perception, and as well as giving more um, cognitive stimulation, including increased learning and memory and more physical activity, then uh, we know that changes in perception um, can change the brain, along with changes in cognition. Perception is really a, a type of cognition, uh, as well as changes in physical activity. So yes, your perception of your environment um, can affect your brain. And in fact, um, your body via stress and so on and emotion, stress and emotion uh, affect not just the brain, but also the body. Um, what is the impact of university level education? Do graduates stave off cognitive decline for longer into their old age, but then have a sharp decline, possi possibly triggered by critical insults? Yeah, great, great question. And these are, you know, uh, the human studies and the studies that we've been doing in these preclinical models support not just physical activity, but cognitive simulation. And so education, I don't think we should focus on tertiary education um, but there is some evidence that um, beyond school education, that tertiary education, and that's not just, you know, as an undergraduate coming straight out of school, the idea of lifelong learning, that you can do a degree at any stage in your life, um, that you don't even have to do a degree, you could do an online course, you could, um, you know, do other forms of complex cognitive stimulation, and that they may have benefits that um, help build up this brain reserve and are protective, so it's, a, it's an active field of research, but it doesn't mean that you have to have a university degree. It just means that, that having a university degree um, is some indicator, a surrogate, if you like, for the fact that that person was generally um, perhaps receiving more cognitive stimulation over time. Um, but others um, without a university degree can still engage in cognitive stimulation um, and, and social interactions are very 
complex form of cognitive stimulation. You know, it's not uh, learning a new instrument, learning a new language. There's, you know, many, many different ways to, um, you know, reading books, maintaining cognitive stimulation. And it can be done in lots of, lots of different ways. Um, so, uh, and physical activity is obviously always very important in diet and sleep and stress, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, the bottom line is, yes, um, increasing your cognitive stimulation, including via education, can provide benefit, but it doesn't have to be via a university degree. Yeah. Um, another question on autism. Um, sorry, just missed it. Uh, okay. Why are we seeing an increase in autism? And how close are you to finding an answer? Mm, wonderful question. And that's what I was trying to capture in that one slide. This is really a hypothesis that we've put forward. And it comes back to what I said, that if it is an increase, and we're talking increase in, in the last generation or two, and um, keep in mind that um, autism was really first described clinically in the 1960s, you know, and, and that after that point, clinicians and healthcare um, workers started to diagnose it from the 1960s onwards. So we can't necessarily make inferences before the 1960s, but in those couple of generations since the 1960s, it does seem to have gone up and therefore it can't be genetics because it's, since the 1960s, the average human genome has not changed. DNA does not change that quickly. It just doesn't. Uh, and we can prove that by sequencing DNA. So it has to have been a change in environment and exposures across populations. And so we need to know what these environmental exposures are and, and we don't really know but we know that in those last two generations as humans have changed on average their lifestyles a lot including um including diets including levels of physical activity including exposure to toxins pollutants you know this is we have to consider everything that's changed in that time and um we don't know why but um, we need to understand why, because if we understand the why, we can help uh, reduce the incidence of autism, but also provide um, better care for individuals and their families um, who are diagnosed with autism. Right. Um, a question about ADHD again. Would the epigenome also play a part in ADHD? Absolutely. So I, I think one of the key types of studies here are what we call... Um, twin studies, identical twin studies. So when you take um, a, a pair of identical twins and follow them, and for example, one develops autism or one develops ADHD, then the chance that the other identical twin develops autism or ADHD is not 100%. And you know, that's a simple uh, interpretation that neither disorder is 100% genetics. It's a, it's a complex mix of genes and environment and as I said, the, the environment may not start just in utero or postnatally, uh, you know, because obviously autism is often diagnosed uh, within the first five years of life or so. So it, it does imply that any environmental factors could be acting early in life, including via the mother, but maybe via, maybe via the, the, the mother and father before conception. Uh, and therefore, just like autism, that, that those epigenetic factors could be at play in ADHD. We don't know what they are. Uh, we need a lot more research, but um, I think there are some parallels between autism and ADHD, and the complex mix of genes, environment, and also the role of epigenetics. Yeah, uh, we'll make this one the last question, unfortunately. Um, uh, Jill says, excellent presentation, Pro Professor Hannon. Have you done any research examining what problematic screen use has on some of the disorders and diseases you have discussed today, including our time in COVID? Look, this is, this is a great question. And I think this reflects the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that you know, our genomes and our bodies and our brains are effectively that of caveman hunter-gatherers. They, they haven't physically changed much in the past hundreds, maybe, you know, maybe a thousand or a couple of thousand years or so. But our environment has, including technology, in many lifestyle factors. And so we don't really know the, the impact of, um, of, of screen time on toddlers and um, children. And so this is an active area of research. And obviously, 
parents are already under enormous pressure and strain uh, in terms of how they parent and no one wants to add to their burden. Screens are hard to avoid, but, um, you know, some of it is, um, comes back to common sense in terms of having a toddler or a young child spend all their day in front of the screen. Yes, it's going to affect their brain. And while they're in front of that screen, they're not physically active uh, and so on. Yes, uh, it could have effects. However, you know, screens can provide educational material. Obviously, with homeschooling, teachers have had to, had to teach via screens. And so, you know, um, I, I like to say with technology, uh, I like to give another analogy that of a stone. Think of, think of a new piece of technology as a stone and sitting there. And until you pick up the stone, uh, that piece of technology has no valence. It's neither good nor bad. Now, you can pick up that stone and you can use it to grind um, flour and make food and do, do really useful things. Or you can pick up the stone and throw it at someone. So until a human interacts with technology, it's neither good nor bad. And all technology has the ability to, to be um, used or abused. And my personal view is that uh, there are a lot of very large companies, uh, very rich companies that are, are making money out of this technology. And, and so we as, we as a community and our governments and our legislature has to make sure that this technology is constrained in a way that it benefits the greatest number of people and it's not, uh, it's not used in ways that are simply making money for a particular company. And that would be my personal view of, of how we use technology, including digital technology. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. We certainly appreciate your interest in Flory's work. A final thank you and acknowledgement to all our Flory donors in the audience. And thank you so much for joining us in our journey. We hope we've given you hope for what the future might bring. Uh, finally, please don't forget to email or call us if you have any questions or would like to donate to our research. Our email um, address is fundraising at flory.edu.au. Take care and goodbye, everyone. Thank you.